Hello, everyone, and welcome to this first session of the Fostering Research Integrity Guest Speaker Series. My name is Sean Lacey. I'm the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer for the University, and I'm delighted to uh, have Dr. Daniel Pizzolato uh, join us today and speak uh, on um, various points of research integrity, research ethics, uh, and the research that he would do on, uh, on the same. So just, I suppose, just maybe to kind of give a, a, a an idea to the flow for, for this session is, I'll hand over to Daniel. Daniel will speak for 10, 25 minutes, uh, sorry, 20 to 25 minutes. And then we'll have, we'll, there'll be time then for a, a questions and answers. So throughout the session, you can be maybe, as we're going through the various slides, you can maybe be putting questions into the chat so that when, when Daniel finishes, we can actually ask those questions. The slides will be shared afterwards. So there's no problem like that. Uh, they will be uh, shared with, uh, with participants uh, after, okay? And so I suppose maybe just before kind of, Handing over to Daniel, we we on part to kind of give a proper introduction uh, to Dr. Pizzolatto, who is a postdoc at the European Network of Research Ethics and is partially at KU Leuven, where he does research integrity training for PhD candidates. Uh, Daniel has a background as a pharmacist with a master's in bioethics and a PhD in biomedical sciences. In fact, Daniel, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, it was actually a year ago, November 22, that you graduated with your PhD. Uh, yep, Daniel's yep. thesis, perfect, yeah. So not that not that all long ago that you were in the, the shoes of being actually a student. Uh, Daniel's thesis was on research integrity training practices and supervision. Also, Daniel uh, does research related to research ethics on mat uh, maternal clinical trials and artificial placenta. And today, Dr. Uh, Daniel Pizzolato will present on responsible supervision practices and role modeling, how to foster responsible supervision in research institutions. Over to you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Sean, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, so I will share my screen so you can have a look at the presentation. That's good. So the title of uh, this presentation is indeed responsible supervision practices and world modeling and how to foster responsible supervision in research institutions. This presentation is based on literature reviews and empirical studies, qualitative and quantitative studies done uh, by international scholars and also by uh, myself and my research and the research team I was uh, working in uh, during my PhD uh, trajectory. So let's start with some basic definitions. How to define mentorship and supervision. Usually mentorship or mentoring is defined as a dyadic relationship between a more experienced or senior person. In this case, it can be the PI, the professor, or the mentor, and the less, a less experienced or junior person the mentee, the supervisee, or the PhD candidate that can be, or the um, undergraduate student. This is normal mentoring, but also there are other typologies of mentoring as uh, peer mentoring, when there is this relationship between two peers. But also we can see, we will see later, uh, a special typology of mentoring, which is the reverse mentoring, in which the, let's say the less, the or the junior person act as mentor for the uh, professor or the senior scholar. Usually mentoring is characterized by institutional proximity and by primarily direct and face-to-face -face contact. In this case, it's very, very important to have a direct, relationship between the supervisor and the supervisee. Mentoring can be established informally, but also can be established formally within the institution. And this, this is the case of the research supervisors and the research supervision practices. Supervision usually refers to guidance of an undergraduate, graduate, postgraduate, or PhD candidate in their research setting, while providing not just knowledge, but also support in different um, ways. Why 
is guaranteeing supervision so complex? Supervision is really another thing. It's different from teaching, where usually the professor or the teacher uh, can use a single approach for hundreds or thousands of students. But within supervision, there is a unique one-on-one -on -one relationship between the supervisor and the supervisee. Um, this relationship is important because, um, as we always, I think, uh, during my three years or four years PhD uh, trajectory, I was uh, speaking more with my supervisor than with my father, for instance. So this relationship is really, really, really important. And in order to work well, there should be a right chemistry between these two parties. Different from teaching, it involves uh, a direct face-to-face -face relation on daily or at least regular basis. We will see that this specific point is really, really discipline specific uh, because we know in, for some discipline, um, may, mainly within the life science uh, where there are there, there is lab related activities, this relationship should be on a daily basis with a direct interaction between the supervisor and the supervisee. For other disciplines, like uh, within the humanities or within the social sciences, this daily basis, sometimes is too strict, but there should be at least uh, a relationship or meetings on a regular basis in order to check it, if everything uh, goes well. Uh, uh, this relationship has to be tailored depending on the supervisee's needs and learning curve, but also depending on the supervisee's maturity. Uh, a supervisee or a PhD candidate can be more mature because, I don't know, um, he or she can have had some external experiences within the private sector before starting the PhD trajectory or between the master thesis and the uh, PhD. Uh, for instance, in my case, I worked for 10 years within the private sector before starting my PhD trajectory as pharmacist. But also, this relationship is very much dependent on the supervisor's supervision skills and learning curve. A supervisor can be less experienced at the beginning of their um, supervision trajectory while more mature and more experienced during the final years. But also this relationship is a unique relationship, can change during the PhD trajectory, uh, can be influenced by internal factors, such as misunderstandings between the supervisor and the uh, supervisee, or uh, depending on different expectations but also can be uh, influenced by external factors such as publication pressure, uh, the PhD or the supervisor level of stress or other, um, other external issues. But also this relationship has to be, must be based on trust. If there is no trust between the supervisor and the supervisee, this relationship doesn't gonna work for long. During uh, a, an empirical study I did during my PhD trajectory in doing interviews with different supervisors, uh, I was able to, uh, let's see, to, to, to discover, let's say, five different typologies of supervision, intellectual and behavioral supervision that can be, that can have a direct impact on research entirety and on responsible research practices, but also managerial and relational supervision that can have an indirect impact on research integrity. By intellectual supervision, uh, I mean, when the supervisor provides scientific competences and skills, and also help the supervisee in navigating the discipline. 
Behavioral supervision, when the supervisor provides explicit uh, responsible research practices, but also in supervisors being good role models. But also there are managerial supervision, when the supervisor help the supervisee doing the PhD trajectory with basic stuff in relation to what to do at the end, uh, for instance, at the end of your first year, or what to do in uh, during a specific uh, uh, period, how to reach specific ICTs in order to get my title, but also relational supervision, how to navigate the academic environment, or how to uh, build a network But why, in terms of research entirety, supervision is so important? Supervision is not just about transferring scientific skills, but also is about transferring research entirety related competencies and good research practices. Good supervision helps to translate into daily practice what usually PhD candidates learn during formal classes. Uh, is useful to provide research integrity discipline specific competences because different disciplines can have different uh, needs and different uh, uh, research integrity uh, and you you need res different research integrity competences good supervision is useful to transfer a high level of ethical standard and professional values but also is useful to help supervisees to understand their responsibilities as researchers. And this can be done in two complementary ways by providing, by supervisors, providing explicit practices. So in helping super supervisees in reviewing data, discussing good research practices or discussing specific research integrity related issues such as data management, uh, or authorship, for instance, but also can be done by um, supervisors providing implicit practices such as good role modeling. Some respons general responsibilities of supervisors. Also these responsibilities uh, towards supervisors and towards society societies uh, I've been gathered during uh, some interviews I've done with supervisors. It's important towards the supervisors to clarify expectations. It's important to have uh, to organize regular meetings or some of the supervisors uh, spoke about an open door policy, which is which does not mean uh, to be always present, but to be available as much as possible when the supervisee uh, needed um, discuss all the steps of the research project starting from the planning of the research um, until reporting the research or writing an article by establishing and following boundaries and standard operating procedures which are crucial in specific disciplines or in lab related activities but also it's important for supervisor to monitor the level of stress of supervisees because we know from uh, literature that the high level of stress can lead supervisees in taking shortcuts, but also can be useful for supervisors to redefine the concept of failure. If you get one paper rejected is not the end of the world. You have to keep trying and do your best to uh, work and do your best to get the next paper accepted. But also supervisors should be responsible to help supervisees in understanding how to navigate the research environment and how to be respectful of colleagues and science but also supervisors have responsibilities towards society because they are responsible for raising supervisees awareness about socioeconomic implication of uh, falsification, fabrication, plagiarism, or questionable research practices. 
they are responsible for raising supervisees awareness of the researchers' social function, but also, and mainly they are responsible for training the next generation of researchers. And in relation to this point, uh, we know from empirical studies that there is a sort of cloning effect. Uh, so good supervisors and responsible supervisor or supervisors being good role models will, let's say, produce uh, good researchers and good in the good next generation of supervisors. So there are empirical studies that show that being a good supervisor is important, not just to train good researchers, but also to train future supervisors. But in relation to research in Tahiti, why supervision is important? There are different typologies of poor supervision practices, starting from not being a good world model, or not giving importance to good research practices. Poor supervision practices can be, for instance, being completely absent or exploiting student work. This is important because poor supervision practices, practices and let's say uh, not good supervisors can give to supervisees a misrepresentation of the research environment and decreasing individual and collective research entity awareness. And all these practices can lead to an increasing, uh, increasing malpractice. Just a few step backs. At the beginning, we define the classic uh, mentoring when the senior uh, academics give information and when the senior academics mentor junior researchers. But in specific cases, can be the other way around. When a junior researcher, more expert in specific things, can be an example, can be how to use uh, artificial intelligence or how to use a response, how to use in a responsible way uh, chat GPT. For instance, in this case, the junior researcher or the PhD candidate can be the mentor of a senior uh, academics. This doesn't mean that the junior researcher has to be the supervisor, but the junior, but super, in this case, the supervisor has to take into consideration that the junior researcher can have more knowledge or can be more skilled in relation to specific things. And this can be a good starting point to foster discussion between the supervisor and the supervisee on specific things or can be in relation to artificial intelligence or new technologies or in relation to open science or in relation to pre-registration studies or in relation to specific research integrity related issues. What are the main challenges, challenges of supervisors? Time management and workload, especially in the case there is just one supervisor. How to balance guidance and, and to at the same time to provide independence to the supervisee. Uh, all the supervisor have the needed skills to be a good supervisor. So there is, all supervisors are trained to be a supervisor. Usually there is lack of resources and guidance from universities in terms of policies and in terms of administrative support. It's really challenging at the beginning of the PhD trajectory, the definition of clear expectation, clear expectation of supervisee, and clear expectation of supervisors. It's really challenging for supervisors how to ensure supervisee ethical conduct because they cannot be there eight hours a day and checking and watch every step of PhD candidates. 
But also, one I think is, or probably the main challenge of a supervisor, when even though the supervisor does everything in order to help the PhD candidates or the uh, supervisee, the supervisee is, let's say, unreceptive or what is defined is an incompetent student. So even though you are trying to be a good supervisor, if the supervisee is not receptive, this relationship does not gonna work. What institution can do to support responsible supervision and to help supervisors and supervisees? Uh, institution can provide guidance and support to super Advisors, institution can provide supervision training, not just in terms of research integrity, but also in terms of soft skills. Institution should not allow one supervisor. This can be helpful for supervisors because of the workload and uh, time restraint, let's say, but also can be helpful for supervisees in order to help them to have more than one point of view and one view of the research environment. Institutions can support responsible supervision by establishing a supervisor committees, by providing regular monitoring of supervision practices, by giving more administrative support, by, have, by having senior supervisors with more experience uh, mentor junior supervisors by promoting interaction among supervisors, but also, and this, this can be really challenging, um, by rewarding responsible supervision practices in different ways, in relation to assessment of professors, but also in relation to uh, promotion. Within a European funded project, SOPS for RI, where developed specific guidelines in order to help institution in supporting responsible supervisions. These guidelines are focusing PhD candidates, are focusing supervisors, but also focusing research leaders. Here, just to finish the presentation, I will give you some let's say, best practices in order to promote responsible supervision. The University of Amsterdam has a nice training program in order to train a supervisor, not just in terms of research integrity, but also in terms of soft skills. University, uh, K11, University of Leuven, at the beginning of each PhD trajectory, required to supervisor and supervisee to sign an agreement in order to clarify all the different expectations. But also, supervisor can have a sort of checklist. In this case, it was developed by the Bridge Project, which is an Erasmus Plus project. So the all supervisors can check if they are their practices are in line with responsible supervision. Thank you for, for your attention and I'm looking forward to any question you might have. Thanks. Thanks, thanks very much, Daniel. That was uh, very interesting. Um, so sorry, sorry, I was just trying to set up the spotlight there for myself here on the Zoom. So um look, the floor is open here for does anyone have any questions? You can put it into the chat or you can unmute and ask either is fine if there are. And there are any questions on anything there mentioned by Daniel? It was interesting just to see that a lot of the the points and the recommendations were based on literature and some of the research that you would have done yourself. And I assume that that. That was that research that you would have done. Was that during your own PhD, uh, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, yeah, the majority of the of the of the things I I presented are coming from 
uh, the studies, the different empirical studies I'm, I've done during my PhD. And um, I think being a super, a PhD candidate is really, really challenging. But also being a supervisor is really challenging. We need to, to build this relationship and you need to work on this relationship in order to have uh, uh, nice studies, but also in order to have a nice uh, research environment, because otherwise uh, it's uh, your, I'm talking to supervisees, your four years PhD trajectory will be a mess. And also your, your studies will be a mess. So, um, because working with high level of stress or with misunderstandings or when you are not really um, happy with your supervisor is not really nice. And this is a consideration I usually do for, because I'm now, I, I, I am in one way a supervisee because I have a supervisor as junior postdoc, but at the same time, I am a junior supervisor because I'm following master students and junior PhD candidates. So it's really challenging to be also in between and to think as a supervisee, but at the same time as a supervisor. So it's not really something you can you can learn in just few uh, by doing some studies or by being a supervisor a couple of times. It's kind of, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. Yeah. And I don't know if you are, you can be really and always a good supervisor because it's really depending on the relationship you have with your supervisee. You can be a good supervisor for one students and not a, that good supervisor for another student. Yeah. And can be also the yeah. other way around. Oh, that's very good. So look, there's a question there. So first, thanks a million, Daniel. Great information. You mentioned about relationships not working on different grounds, which actually just speaks to what you were saying there now, Daniel. But I wonder if you have advice when this relationship breaks down. For example, if the PhD candidate is not receptive or of advice or instructions, etc. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's um, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy because can be the the supervisee can be not receptive because it's not receptive at all, and he or she doesn't care. But also because there are there can be problem of communication between the supervisor and the supervisee. So um, this is why. Uh, Having or fostering discussion among supervisors can be helpful in order to, to exchange, let's say, tips and tricks or how to uh, do specific things or how to get advices or piece of advice from other supervisor or more experienced or, or a supervisor who already had this experience with unreceptive students. So this can be helpful for for supervisor for sure that's interesting but also um, to, so to, but also to the directly discuss with the student to see if there are problems what are the problems because sometimes or the majority of the time the main problem is just about communication yeah, no, that, that that's good. That, that's kind of what you're saying there. It nearly speaks to kind of nearly having a community of practice for supervisors, this kind of informal kind of platform yeah. for them to kind of communicate and kind of share, yeah, not, not yeah. necessarily a moan or anything, but share experiences and kind of to learn from the early career research supervisors and to learn from the senior supervisors. Yeah, yeah. Vice yeah. versa as well. Yeah, yeah. This can be done in formal way. So you have uh, institution that requires supervisor to to talk each other or this can be done in informal way during a coffee uh, talking about something else 
Perfect. So there are different ways in queue you can approach this uh, this problem. Okay, so since there's not there's not other, so I mean if there's any other questions, please don't hesitate to pop into the chat. I have two there just to kind of um just to pick up on uh so obviously and I, I'm thinking of the module that we have within uh, in M2 foster research integrity that uh, is uh, delivered to the structured PhD students and there's three arms to that kind of module about research integrity research ethics and open research. And I suppose I just want to speak to the last one, that what if as a student, you realize the importance of disseminating your work openly? So you understand the importance of open access. You want to share your, your methods openly. So the idea maybe your script that you're using uh, or the uh, even have a data management plan. So you realize that there's this importance, but yet when you go to your supervisor, the supervisor, came through a system that never had placed any importance in this. And so it isn't necessarily very encouraging. And I'm not saying that this is actually the case. This is just kind of generally talking about an idea. How would you approach that? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not easy. I mean, um, what I think and what I noticed that junior people are more willing to, to share their work openly without any restriction and sometimes uh, uh let's say supervisors are not really willing to do it especially junior supervisors because when you are at the end of your career professional career more or less you kind of don't care about uh, your h index or your research out outputs but when you have you when you are a junior professor you need to publish, you need to be recognized. So there is this clash between uh, being willing to share your work without any restriction and being acknowledged for your work. Because, I mean, we have to be realistic. Um, in order to have a career within the academia, you need to publish and you need to be recognized. This can be done also if you share openly your data because um, more and more institutions take in consideration also, oh, okay, you shared your script or you shared your data on this, website or on this, um, uh, let's say, databases. And they take in consideration also this kind of research uh, outcomes. So I think, I think there's the need to find a balance between uh, open science and what is academia, the academia right now. And there can be, even though, you aim to publish and to be recognized in a good journal with a nice impact factor and so on. All, all this data can be pre-registered openly as preprint, as uh, um, by registering your study or in other different ways. So there is no can be can be done both in both ways but of course there is a clash between being open and being recognized for your work within the academia and i think this can be solved by reforming all the way in which researchers are assessed or promoted but yeah this is another story probably yeah and like there is obviously that conversation going on internationally around reforming the research yeah. assessment core and stuff like that. So look, there's I suppose yeah. there is a movement, and like like all these things change can be slow at times. Um, another question there was just a point that you mentioned. And look, first I, I thought actually before I say it, I thought it was just very useful. Uh, the slides that they were kind of very much kind of giving kind of guidance on how to do things, which I think is very useful. I think it, we're at this point where we realize the research integrity is important. Uh, but it's sometimes it be a case of, look, we may not know how do we actually do certain things. So I felt that your slides were very helpful there, kind of giving the guidance to kind of, uh, I suppose, signposting to a certain extent. But one thing that you mentioned there about 
supervisors is that institute as in uh, the responsibility maybe of an institution is how to reward to think about how to reward responsible supervision practices that was kind of like towards your end and i suppose i'm just curious to yeah maybe examples that you might have encountered that you might know of other institutions <laughs> that how they're rewarding this <laughs> Okay, so it's really because the, the starting point is when you, as a professor, when you do courses uh, at the end of your classes or at the end of the semester, you get assessed by the student. You were a good teacher, you were not a good teacher during the semester. The same can be done for supervision practices, even though it's really, it's really challenging how to measure supervision practices. Um, there are no uh, standard or, or common examples within the European setting. There are few, few, few best practices, for instance, uh, um, in the Luxembourg University, each year gives two, let's say, mentorship awards. So PhD candidates and students can vote for their supervisor or their mentor, so they get rewarded at the end of the academic year uh, with a badge as a super, good supervisor. Um, but there are no real examples within the European context where good supervision is assessed and how to do it because you, you, you cannot use metrics, how can assess supervision? Because supervision, you can be a good supervisor for, in my opinion, but you can be not that, that good supervisor for my lab mate. So you need to develop a kind of measurement system that can be, um, can be used 360 degrees because you can use narrative, you can use, but at the, at the end, it's, uh, it's the supervisee cat that, who have an impression on the supervisor. And this kind of impression can be good because I, you can be a good supervisor in my opinion, because when we, we are talking also about whatever, football, soccer, volleyball, basketball, and not just on research. While for some people you can be a good supervisor because you really focus on my research career. And there are no standards within Europe. And for sure, being a good supervisor is not used now to be assessed as researchers or as a, a junior professor, but also is not used in case of promotion. So it's uh, it's really a work in progress. Mm -hmm. I try to to ask this question during my interviews, and I did twenty five interviews. I got twenty five different uh, replies. Mm -hmm. For some people, it's not possible. For some people, it's just a good idea, but they don't know how. So there is a lot of work to do. No, that, that's great. Daniel, thanks very much. Uh, I don't, there's no other questions in the chat there. So if there's no one else maybe wants to say anything, we can maybe close it here. Um, no, just a just few, uh, because I was do, within my, my, let's say, academic trajectory, I was mainly a supervisee a supervisee, so a PhD candidate. So maybe if I can give some tips or tricks to uh, supervisees online, they can be, if you have problems, uh, discuss with your supervisor, discuss with some other senior colleague discuss with your peers uh, you are not there kind of alone by yourself and majority of the time the supervisor your supervisor has the right uh, answers 
to more or less everything. So if you have problems, uh, just talk with your supervisor, talk with your colleagues, uh, and 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 but because everything can be can be really can be solved, even though you think it's kind of a huge problem. And it's actually interesting that you mentioned that now because a, a question just came into the chat there. So again, and, thank. Thank you very much for a great presentation. But the person says here they would like to ask. A, uh, so how can so how can we improve good and effective? How can we have good and effective communication with supervisors in term of re research context? How can we improve? Sorry, I read that wrong. Oh, no, sorry. How can we improve good and yeah. effective communication with supervisor in term of research context? <coughs> yeah, first by being available. Because sometimes uh, um, you have really, really supervisors uh, replying to your emails in two, three weeks, a month, never. So first, <laughs> being available, both because in both ways you can have supervisors not replying to emails, but you can have also supervisees not replying to emails. So be available. Um, one good way is to try to discuss as much as much as possible about everything to be clear but also there are uh what i'm doing now since i'm approaching my new role as junior supervisor i'm doing a online training on communication on soft skills on how to deal with different issues uh how to deal with um, how to communicate my what I have to communicate in good way, how to deal with possible conflict. So there are different uh, ways in which you can learn how to be a good communicator because being a good researcher is something as it, and is important to be a good supervisor, but it's not everything. In order to be a good supervisor, you need to be also a good communicator a good, uh, let's say, stepfather, in a way, <laughs> or stepmother. Um, and to be aware that just by asking how, how, how you do, everything is okay, family is okay, it's something and can change the relationship. How to be just involved in um, that can be done um, in more cynic way one reply i got from one supervisor was uh, i don't care if they fight with the girlfriend with the boyfriend uh, but if there are problems uh, personal problems i have to know them because those problems can have an influence and can have an impact uh, on the PhD candidate work on my work or on the work of my uh, lab. Or there is a different approach. I care for my super, for my PhD candidate. I want to know if there are problems because I care. Because for me, it's like a stepson or a stepdaughter. So there is different ways, but for sure, Good be available, good communication, and trying to be present is a good way to to have a good relationship. And then this good relationship can, of course, can mirror uh, a good work, good studies, good outcomes, and and everything can make everything easier for the supervisor and for the supervisee. Yeah. Look, that, that's very helpful, Daddy. Thanks very much. And maybe just to the people in the room, like, I mean, it can happen maybe that there's a breakdown in communication between, the, we'll say, the student and the supervisor, and the student may feel isolated. And I just think it's important just to highlight that within our system, within M2, we have graduate supervisory panels. So if you, as a student, maybe feel isolated, that you don't, the communication has broken down to your supervisor, that's where their supervisory panel then can really be helpful there. Okay. And I suppose just to be yeah. aware of that because these things can actually happen as well. Look, Daniel, that's brilliant. There's been very positive feedback in the chat there. 
So look, thank, thanks very much for your time. Uh, like thanks. always, thank you. I asked, would you do this? But I mean, and you accepted. But I mean, I put work on you by doing this because you have to prepare for this, and this is an hour of your time to do this. Not to mention the time pre preparing for the slides. So thanks very much for that. Very much appreciated. No problem. And the feedback. No there problem. Very happy. Positive as well, then. Happy. Happy to add because, as I said, I was a I was a PhD, uh, a PhD candidate. I was um, I would say quite lucky with my. I, my supervisor, we because probably because when I started my PhD, I was already 38, 39 years old. So I had my experiences outside the academia. I probably I knew better how to relate with other people rather than a master student, for instance. But I know different people, different colleagues with really, really bad experiences. And the majority of them were based on miscommunications. Yeah. Okay. Daniel, thanks very much. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. For your Thank. Time. Okay. Thank you, Sean, one. for inviting me. Thank you.